overview of the FXB Center, which is one of the centers that I'm involved with whilst I'm over here in the US, and a lot of the work that um, we do there, and through Sea Change, which is the Center for Climate Health and the Global Environment, which is centered around uh, the health impacts of climate change and the various facets of combating that. I won't spend too much time going through my bio. Joan did a great introduction. The main thing that I would like to point out is um, a lot of my focus is on adaptation. So that's sort of where I sit in the research world. But I also do work on mitigation. Obviously, it's completely crucial to um, combating climate change and the work that I do in my government role and my role um, in the Australasian College for Emergency Medicine is centered around both. But my specific research focuses are looking more at adaptation. And I will go into a little bit more about why I particularly think that's important as we go along. The climate change and health, why does COP matter? What is COP? We'll delve into some of those questions. Um, now, I'm making the assumption that all of you have a pretty good grip on climate change and health in general, so I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty of that. If there are any specific questions anybody has about um, climate change and health effects, I'm very happy to answer those questions at the end, so just bring them up. All right, so just before I go on to talking about COP itself, I want to talk a little bit about where we are at the moment. So currently we are looking like we're heading for greater than 2.5 degrees of warming. And if we did absolutely nothing, we're heading towards four. So we're not doing nearly enough, even with sort of more ambition and renewed targets from different countries. We are absolutely not where we need to be. And this is where we are. So I think Many of you may have lived experience of the impacts of climate change on your communities and the health of people around you. We are seeing impacts across the world from extreme weather on a weekly basis now. And that's what our world now looks like at 1.2 degrees Celsius. One of the reasons that I'm really passionate about adaptation and preparing our communities and our healthcare systems um, to handle these effects of climate change better is because we know that even if we do everything we can to slow global warming and to keep everything under 1.5 as we need to, we know that we will still see the kind of weather events we are currently seeing for decades and decades to come. So as well as being very ambitious on decreasing carbon emissions, we need to realize that no matter what we do, we need to be preparing our communities to handle what is happening and what will continue to happen. So not only is it extreme weather events, uh, there's been some recent papers that have come out that really show the impacts of climate change on human diseases. So we can see here the climate hazards on the left hand side. So we have things like warming, precipitation, floods and drought. In the middle is the transmission type for human diseases. And on the right hand side is the kind of diseases that we are now seeing that are being amplified by climate change. So six, uh, 76 viral diseases, 69 bacterial diseases, and a whole host of other things. There is now good evidence that these are all getting worse because of climate change, and that is going to continue to happen. A special mention um, on heat as well, that is going to be one of the biggest killers that we face. And there's been a lot of research done you'll be able to see that this graph is from Australia, hence the Celsius down the right-hand side. If you have a look at 45 degrees, that's about 113 degrees Fahrenheit. And then 35 degrees is about 95 degrees Fahrenheit. In our capital cities in Australia, where this particular graph is from, we do regularly see days that are sitting up above 110 Fahrenheit. We know from research that when we do have intense heat days such as those, we do see an increase in deaths and severe illness in our population as well. Across the globe, there's going to be more severe heat waves and more of them, and we are going to see increasing deaths and increasing morbidity from heat, even if we meet all of the targets we need to meet to reduce carbon emissions. So we're looking at roughly 250,000 additional deaths per year between 2030 and 2050. Heat, as I mentioned, also infectious diseases and diarrheal illnesses. And then we delve into things such as malnutrition and undernutrition, uh, particularly in children. That's related to food security and the impacts of climate change on being able to grow crops and things like that. So this is going to have significant impacts on our global population. And a special mention as well about the very 
significant impacts that climate change has on the health of children. So about 88% of the global burden of disease that's due to climate change is happening in children. And children are being disadvantaged more significantly than adults are. And really they have not contributed to climate change um, in a significant way like, like many of us already have. So we are going to see some very significant intergenerational inequities and the big issue of climate justice and what kind of planet we need to leave for our children and what duty we have to leave them a healthy planet are significant issues. Okay, this is just a quick overview of the relationship between hazard exposure and vulnerability. As this is, I think, quite a good diagram. Some of this will become um, more relevant while I'm talking about it as we go through what COP is about. So we have our hazard um, climate change related extreme weather. Then we have exposure. So if you're an outdoor person working outdoors, um, if you don't live in housing that has good air conditioning, all of these things intersect, as well as socioeconomic conditions, mobility, gender, elderly populations, children, as I've mentioned they all go together to um, create the risk profile for a community. And then we see the impacts and the outcomes from those systems as well. So it's really quite complex. And one of the things that we can look at is where do we target what we need to do for adaptation in particular? We can target it in this area on the left here, the hazard area, by trying to do what we can about mitigation and trying to reduce the um, chances of these events escalating. But then also looking at the social determinants of health and working across sectors, so not only within our healthcare sector, but working with transport and working with um, housing and all of those different areas to have a look at what we can do to reduce the risk from people if they have a better built environment, if they have the ability to not work outside when it's 113 degrees, that is an adaptation me measure that reduces the risk and poor health outcomes for populations. And then addressing things like poverty too uh, is a significant adaptation measure also. Okay, we'll just skip over this one. So this is one of the reasons that COP is very important. So this is where we are at the moment, our present situation. If we don't do anything, we head down the red pathway into a world where it's very, very difficult for us to adapt. There's a lot of ecosystem degradation. There's very high poverty. Everything becomes worse and it's much harder for us to protect our communities and do what we need to do. If we do what we need to do on a governmental level and obviously trying to tackle this from a grassroots level as well, and we are heading where we need to with our mitigation strategies, it makes adaptation a lot easier as well. So the two things go hand in hand and are equally crucial. All right, moving along to talking about what is COP. What is COP? So COP stands for the Conference for the Parties and the parties that they're referring to are the signatory states of the convention. And that is an awful lot of countries across the world. And the idea of a COP is to get together on an international stage to advance international objectives and implement them as well. There's actually three different COPs. So COP, the COP we'll be talking about is the COP that most people mean when they say COP, but there's actually two different COPs aside from um, the UNFCCC, which is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the Climate Change COP. There's also a convention on um, combating desertification, and there's also one on biological diversity, and that was held quite recently as well, COP15 for, for biological diversity. So there's three COPs. The one that I attended in Egypt in November uh, is the UNFCCC COP or the Climate COP, and that's the one we'll be talking about tonight. So there's been quite a lot that's happened um, or not happened, depending on how you want to look at it, over the last uh, few decades. So in 1972 was the, the first recognition from the United Nations on a global level about the need for an environmental program, and that was in Stockholm. We didn't see anything around climate happen until about 1979. And in 1988, we got the establishment of the International Panel on Climate Change. So that's the IPCC. And many of you will have seen those reports. They are the reports that set the basis for the science. They're the reports that look at what we need to do and what we're not doing um, that are really the benchmark for determining where we need to go with our action on climate change. And that panel was established in 1988. 
If we move along, 1992 was the Rio Earth Summit, which is where the United Nations Framework um, Convention on Climate Change was adopted. And that's the UNFCCC that we talk about now. Other key points along this timeline, the Kyoto Protocol was adopted in 1997, and that was the first greenhouse gas emissions reduction treaty in the world. And that entered force in 2005. Then if we skip right along to 2016, that is when the Paris Agreement entered into force. So that was um, created in 2015 and entered into force in 2016. And that agreement is one that you'll hear mentioned a lot. It's the bedrock of the ambition for countries on what they need to do for mitigation and adaptation and a few other things on climate change. So we, if we have a little bit more of a look at the Paris Climate Agreement, because it is very crucial to everything else we're talking about. And I will just jump back here to say the Kyoto Protocol, which as you may remember from the previous slide, um, was the first greenhouse gas emissions reduction protocol, was not signed by the US, which was the biggest emitter at the time. So that was not adopted by the US, but the Paris Agreement was. So the Paris Agreement has replaced the Kyoto Protocol and has been adopted by almost 200 countries. And the idea of the Paris um, Climate Agreement is number one, to limit the global temperature to less than two degrees Celsius and for countries to achieve net zero emissions by mid-century, to enhance those adaptation measures that are so crucial that we talked about and to have a look at the financing and what we need to do to be able to enable countries to afford to do what they need to do to protect their populations. So those are the three parts of the Paris Climate Agreement. And really the core of what happens at a COP is the parties, which are the different countries, come together to discuss whether there should be any amendments to agreements, what else they need to do, but more than that, how to implement and achieve these three key targets. A lot happens every year before a COP. So we've sort of talked about the long timeline, but in a single year, there's a lot of different meetings that happen on the way to COP. So this is the timeline for last year. And you can notice here that there are a bunch of meetings of the IPCC where they get together and write their reports and have a look at what they need to say uh, on a global level about where we're headed. And then all the way down here um, to COP27, which is when all the parties convened together last year in Egypt as it was. Okay, so the IPCC I mentioned before, just giving that another shout out, that is really, that is the science, that is the um all of the expertise that says this is where we are at, this is where we are not, and this is where we should be going. So this is last year's report, climate change is getting worse, we're not doing what we need to do. We are seeing the fastest rates of sea level rise in the last 3,000 years, unprecedented glacial retreat, um, sea ice disappearing and, and CO2 concentrations continuing to rise. And unequivocally, we aren't doing what we need to do when we have such a narrow window in which to do it. And these are the kind of statements that the IPCC comes out with. I really like these reports because they have so much detail in them and they um, are not political in what they say. They really lay it out in terms of what we need to do to get where we, we need to be to keep warming below 1.5. I will just mention NDCs. So you might hear that mentioned sometimes. So those are the nationally determined contributions. So those are the plans that each country has to achieve the goals for the Paris Agreement. So you might hear them talked about as we want to um, reduce emissions by 43% by 2030 and be net zero by 2050. This is how we're going to do it. Countries come out at various times um, with the different statements around that. But when someone is talking about an NDC, that's what they mean. And it's essentially climate targets in, in lay language. It's the plan to get the countries to where they need to be. Very disappointingly, uh, we did not make great progress in this COP on increasing ambition on climate targets. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, later. Even the countries here that submitted a stronger target. So COP is one of the places that the countries can go and say, we're updating our target. We're going to be more ambitious about it. Australia, for example, we had um, a government changed early last year. So early 2022, we had an election. We had a government that was doing virtually nothing on climate change. 
replaced by a government that's doing something, hence we can say there's a stronger target, but not doing enough. So if we go across to this um, slide here, across the top is, are the NDCs, so are the plans of the countries doing what they need to do to get the countries to where they need to be to keep warming to less than 1.5? So essentially that's net zero by 2050. We can see along the top here, the green is yes, uh, 1.5 degrees would be achieved if they stuck to these policies. Almost sufficient, insufficient, highly insufficient and critically insufficient. And you can see that no country has any policies that will get them to where they need to be to achieve net zero by 2050 and to keep global warming under 1.5. There's a lot of countries, I would say not a lot, but there's a decent amount in the almost sufficient bracket there. So the UK notably has done quite a lot recently quite a bunch in the insufficient category, Australia and the US are both there. And then we're moving all the way through to critically insufficient. So places like Russia, um, Iran, Mexico are doing virtually nothing. What you don't see on here is there's a lot of smaller countries that would be in the green category, but they're not represented on here because this is really looking at the higher level of carbon emissions. So some of the Pacific Islands, for example, have negative net carbon emissions. So they're certainly where they need to be. But if none of these countries do what they need to do, then it's not going to make a significant difference. So if all countries were to um, do what they're doing in terms of current policy, we're looking at 2.7 degrees of global warming. If we're looking at targets, so what the countries have committed to, we're looking at 2.4. If we look at pledges and targets, so the official targets plus some countries are saying, oh, we would like to do X, then we would be headed towards two. The absolute best case scenario, which includes full implementation of all targets, including everything, would keep us to 1.8. So we are not anywhere close to where we need to be in terms of our global um, ambition to limit global warming. All right. So COP27, that was the meeting that occurred in November. So that's the conference of the parties of the United Nations framework um, for the climate convention. So at that meeting, there's representatives from governments and organizations all across the world. So non-governmental organizations, climate activists, private industries, et cetera. And that happened in Sharm El Sheikh, which is a resort town in Egypt in the middle two weeks of November last year. The priorities going into the COP were mitigation, as we talked about, adaptation, finance. So when we're talking about finance in this context, we're really talking about um, the global finance for adaptation measures, particularly one of the thorny things that comes up around this is rich countries who um, emit far more carbon emissions than those in the global south and their duty to provide um, that finance for those countries who will suffer more who are the countries in the global south, um, to combat uh, climate change in terms of adaptation. Loss and damage is a special kind of finance, which we did have a fairly good outcome in this COP um, around that. So that is looking at providing finance to countries, not for adaptation, but to address um, climate events that have already happened. So it's sort of like if somebody falls in a river, for example, it's getting them out of the river, but it's not preventing them falling in in the first place. So money for adaptation is the preventative money. Money for loss and damage is addressing the loss and damages that occur because of climate-induced extreme weather events that are already happening. Global stock take is the other part of the COP priority list, and that refers to the duty for all countries every five years to step back and see where they are at in terms of meeting their um nationally determined contributions and their path towards where they need to go. So we'll flip our focus a little bit and I'm going to talk a bit about on an individual basis, people like us, how do we get to a COP and what do we do there? If you're not part of a government and you're not negotiating, how does one get to a COP and what kind of things do you do when you're there? So there's three categories of attendees who are permitted to attend the COP. So there's the representatives of the parties to the convention and observer states. So that's essentially government. And those are the people doing the negotiations. There's press and media. 
And then there's representative observer organizations. So NGOs and intergovernmental organizations as well. Some of them have observer status to attend COP. So you have to apply as an organization. All NGOs don't have observer status just by virtue of being an NGO. They have to go through a process with the United Nations to obtain observer status. And then those country, uh, those organizations that have observer status can send people to COP or apply for those passes. So there's blue zone passes and green zone passes. Blue zone is the pass that gets you in through the security checkpoint to the negotiations, the official spaces and the plenary space. Green, and you need to be with an organisation who has observer status to be able to enter that place or part of the press or um, part of the governmental delegations. The green zone how it worked last year, and I think this is how it works usually, was general public could go. You had to apply on the website, but it was very just filling your name and you got an email to say you can go. And that was a lot more of the side events, exhibits, workshops, sort of community-based things that anybody could go to. So I attended um, with the national, um, the NGO for the Commission for the Status of Women through the UN. I had not had anything to do with them before. So one of the things that you need to do when you want to attend a COP is get a whole list of all of the different NGOs that have observer status, and you can find that on the UN website, and then you have to email people. So if you are not with an organisation who has observer status, then it's a process of writing a lot of nicely worded emails to say, hello, this is me. I would really like to attend COP with your organisation. And I was lucky enough to get a pass um, through this organization that enabled me to, to go to the blue zone. So there was nothing to stop me going to COP regardless, but I would not have been able to enter that space that has the official negotiations and all of the other official bits and pieces that are going on um, at COP. So the first thing I mentioned is the built environment. Uh, it was very striking to me. It's Sharm El Sheikh, it's a resort town, but it's essentially in the desert. So it's on the Sinai Peninsula. And they've just created all of this infrastructure for COP in the middle of the desert. What you can see here on the left is they're planning to build a resort that has just a incredibly large pool, which is more like an inland sea, which to me seemed very contrary to the objectives of meeting together to talk about climate change. Um, but that's the kind of environment that was happening around there. And the built environment of COP itself was really an urban heat island, hence the picture in the top left. So very few heat, um, trees, very, very hot, really made us appreciate exactly why we were there and, and how important what we're trying to do is. So one of the first things we did was go to the high level segment, um, which is where the countries come together and, and they, they were lucky enough to have the leaders of quite a few countries come up to present. So I think the day before I went, um, Emmanuel Macron from France, uh, I think Rishi Sunak from the UK gave speeches. The one that I went to was a lot of the smaller island nations who spoke and it was very, very moving and sad and really shattering because we had many of those leaders from those countries stand up and say, we have done virtually nothing to contribute to global carbon emissions cumulatively throughout history, but our countries are being destroyed. And some of the countries, as I mentioned before, are actually negative in terms of their carbon emissions, but are already seeing catastrophic impacts from climate change, and that will just get worse and worse. So it was quite heartbreaking to see country after country after country stand up and say that, but then we didn't have the leaders of countries who have significant carbon emissions and really need to do something about mitigation standing up to say, we're going to do that. So I think that was very, a very difficult part of this um, convention. Negotiations, I mentioned, are really what COP exists for. So negotiating the text that comes out of it, there's a lot of different areas that are negotiated. So what happens at a COP is the parties get together and they rewrite um, parts of what needs to come out of that. So this one on the left here, I went to one of the gender negotiations. So what that was around was writing all of the language around gender and, uh, and what we need to do in terms of gender under the UNFCC framework. On the right, this was a group 
um, of us that was a health policy group. So I did not know any of these people before I went to COP, but we all met up and every day we would sit down and um, every everybody there had gone to different negotiations. So some people would have gone to loss and damages. Some of people would have gone to the adaptation negotiations. And then we sat down and we went through what had been said and what we thought needed to happen or needed to be inserted in terms of text in regards to um, uh, health. So one of the things, for example, being involved in the, in the gender negotiations was there was a lot of wording around the impacts, the disproportionate impacts of climate change on women, but not on women's health. So one of the things that we did afterwards would be to go up to those who were negotiating from different countries, introduce ourselves and say, actually, it's very important that we specifically mention health in this area, or this is a special area where health will be impacted. So even though none of us were part of governmental delegations and none of us were negotiating, there's that ability to influence what actually comes out of COP as a product. And COP is very important in that way because it is the mechanism that the world gets together to make these decisions. All right. I will just quickly mention the country pavilions. So aside from the official negotiation space, there are uh, lots of big pavilions and within those pavilions they have country pavilions so many countries had their own little area and some of them were quite striking so if you see down the bottom here this is the UAE pavilion so it was this massive neon and polished white floor and pine wood expensive looking area and opposite that was um Nigeria's pavilion which was just a wall basically with a few flags and very little money behind it obviously so that you really did see that stark inequity even within the country pavilions the country pavilions are very interesting because you can go along and go up to any of those pavilions they've all got different programs that happen throughout the day so every day there is um, programs throughout these pavilions that run concurrent to the negotiations people talking giving speeches you can speak to different governmental people who are there people from ngos are there uh, and it's a, it's a great space to get together and meet people and see what different countries are doing. The WHO Pavilion. So this last COP was the second year that health had actually had a program at COP. So it's quite striking that health had not been elevated significantly in any way until two years ago. And this um, is one of the, the big centerpieces now is the World Health Organization Pavilion. So it's this little pavilion they have a program that runs all day every day where they have very interesting speakers covering everything that's climate and health related and many of us spent quite a lot of time there who weren't attending negotiations it's a great place to meet people in the global climate and health world as well side events there's lots of other things happening as well so this event here um was about a program that I'll talk about at the end, which is the ATTACH program. So there's many initiatives and things that were being announced that weren't part of the official negotiations that, that any of the attendees could go along and listen to if they had a Blue Zone pass. So that was quite interesting. And then constituency meetings. So one of my colleagues from Harvard and I, um, because we were both with the UN gender group, we went to the gender meetings every morning. So they're just informal meetings where everybody who is interested in a particular topic can get together but it was quite amazing and really eye-opening so we had many people who um, presented in different languages in a traditional dress we had um, people who stood up and said if you're from the global north you really need to step back and let us speak because the global south is suffering and and you've done it uh, which as a privileged person from the global north is quite confronting to hear but also really important and a lot of really interesting discussion and networking happened in those meetings. So they were fantastically valuable to go to. All right, so what did this COP achieve? Well, it did achieve some things, which is great. So attach I mentioned before, this is uh, what has come out of the COP26 health program. So this is mechanisms to try and do some of these key things. So finance the health commitments, build um, climate resilient health systems, um, look at improving supply chains and looking at low carbon sustainable health care as well. So ATTACH is the World Health Organization 
group that is trying to get finance and really get the mechanisms to make these things happen as well. So this official collaboration was announced at this COP, uh, which hopefully will make a significant difference. Some frustrating things, as I've alluded to throughout this talk, uh, there was not great progress on mitigation. There weren't any significant announcements really from any of the key countries to say, we're, we're going to move much harder on this and do what we need to do. Startlingly, there were 636 lobbyists from oil and gas industries registered at COP. And you know that some of that money was underlying things like the UAE Pavilion. And it wasn't always obvious where those people were and occasionally you'd speak to someone and you'd find out that they kind of uh, secretly were there through that mechanism which is undermining everything we need to do really. Uh, next year, sorry this year, COP is in Dubai which as many of you would appreciate is an oil producing nation and that has created a lot of um, consternation among many people that I know who attended this COP some of whom have said I will not be attending the next COP because it's in Dubai. Uh, I see it a little differently than that. I think we can use the fact that it is in Dubai to really highlight how hypocritical that is and the issues around fossil fuels and what we need to do as well. So that's how I'm trying to see the fact that it's in Dubai this year. Inequity of impacts I've mentioned, and I'll just talk about loss and damage after this. So on the left here, really shows us the vulnerability of different nations. So the global South is going to disproportionately suffer from the impacts of climate change on health. And if we look at the right, it's the global North that is uh, providing the most significant cumulative carbon emissions. So it's very unfair. And that's where the, the kind of theory underlying what we need to do for loss and damage comes from. So loss and damage is basically saying to the rich countries, they must support the lower income countries and the vulnerable countries to address the health impacts of climate change. So what we did see, and, and probably the greatest thing to come out of this COP, was a commitment to establish a loss and damage fund uh, was put into writing, which looked very unlikely before COP and really is pretty fantastic that that's one of the outcomes of this COP. Loss and damage was first mentioned in 1990 as something that should be done, and it's taken us an awful long time to get here. What still needs to be done is there's been the agreement that yes a loss and damage fund needs to happen but we don't have the commitment from the rich nations to provide the money that's needed to address the damages and the loss for the lower income countries we're looking at trillions of dollars and it's going to be very difficult I think for us to get that global ambition to financing that and that's the, the big tricky piece of this 1.5 degrees I have mentioned an awful lot in this talk. There's just a couple more things I will mention about that and I'm nearly finished, but 1.5 degrees, there was a little bit of pressure from particularly, uh, I think backed by fossil fuel interests to abandon the 1.5 degree target and remove that wording from the wording that came out of COP. Why do we care so much about 1.5? Well, this is why the difference between 1.5 and 2 is not really just 0.5 degrees. So it doesn't sound like a lot. It sounds like, oh, it's, it's half a degree of warming. But the magnitude of impact is way higher than just that 0.5. So we will see 10 times more sea ice free summers in the Arctic if we reach 2 degrees, 30% greater decline in coral reefs, three times greater loss of insect species. We will just see cascading, worsening events if we go to two as opposed to 1.5, which is why it's critically important we keep fighting to get to 1.5 whilst we still can. So one of the achievements from, from COP was that the wording around still trying to get to 1.5 remained in the text. So that's really quite critical. Okay, this is almost the very end. Why I've put this slide up is these are wheat silos. So in Australia, and this is the state I live in, South Australia, they've done a big project where they painted these beautiful murals on the side of silos. And the reason I'm using this um, slide is one of the greatest things for me from COP was getting out of the health silo and really discussing the health impacts of climate change with people in other sectors. And we've created some great collaborations with people who are across transport, who are across housing, who are across many different areas 
to really make them appreciate why the health voice is so important. At the beginning of COP, I had a number of people from different sectors say to me, what, why is health matter in many of these things? And it was great to be able to, to create these conversations around things like transport should not just be about electrifying cars. Transport discussions should be about creating better communities and green spaces and active transport and the co-benefits of that. And if you don't have a health voice in those discussions, then that is all lost. So it was really great to break out of silos and be able to talk to um, people from many different places about health and climate change. Okay, and the other thing that is worthy of mentioning is um, there was an announcement by John Balbers from the OCCHE that the US and the UK are going to collaborate on a proposal to align procurement requirements as much as possible in the health systems, which is quite significant. So that addresses scope three emissions. So that's all of the indirect emissions in a healthcare system. So it's things like medicines and transport and business and food and catering and all of those other things. The NHS in the UK has done a lot in this space and they're heading rapidly heading towards being net zero in their health system. So the fact that they are now collaborating with the US to be very green in terms of their scope through policies is a great achievement and um, was a real highlight from COP. All right. Um, just before I finish up, I'll just mention this, if, if none of you have heard of this, this is the Harvard newsletter, The Climate Optimist. I have nothing to do with this aside from being associated with it, but it is really a lot of the good news about things that are happening and a great read if you're feeling very down and, and sad about um, our global situation, because there's a lot of positive things that are happening as well. So I'll just highlight that uh, for you too. And thank you. And I do get chance to stop off in Cairo for a day on my way back to the US and I got to see the pyramids which was great hence this picture so a little bit of sightseeing as well thank you so much thank you Dr Humphrey I really appreciate it um so far in the chat we've had a couple comments about how um uh informative your presentation is. oh I think you're on mute Thought I hit it. Sorry, I apologize. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Humphrey. Um, anyway, um, I, uh, quite a few chat uh, comments in the chat about how informative the presentation has been. Um, people were surprised about your comment about um, uh, the attendance of um, uh, lobbyists from the oil and gas oh. industry at this event. It just struck that uh, very unusual. Um, and there's a question about whether your slides can be made available. Uh, we can post them to our website if that's all right with you. Just email them to myself Absolutely. or Emily. Yeah, very happy to do that. We'll get them up as well as there'll be a recording. I've been, I, I missed the intro because I was busy talking, but we will be uh, sharing that available if you want to rewatch anything. Um, are there any other questions? I, I'm going to unmute um, everybody. So um, you can unmute yourself now if you want. Does anybody have a question? Uh, this is Bob McClellan, can you hear me? Yes, Bob, go ahead. Hi, thank you, uh, Kimberly. That was a uh, fascinating insider's view. Um, I'm wondering what you, you brought back to your work, um, both uh, any clinical work, but um, what did you bring back, at least from a, a research perspective, from an advocacy perspective, from a um, healthcare um, compliance with, uh, you know, zero emissions approach, you know, scope one through three? What, what did you bring back, uh, well, to Harvard, but then back to Australia? Yeah, absolutely. It's a really good question. And one of the things that I get asked a lot is, uh, if you care about climate change, how can you justify everybody flying across the world to attend this conference and uh, the carbon emissions associated with that, et cetera. The way I sort of look at that is if we can, if the good that we do through this outweighs the harm in terms of the carbon emissions to getting there, then I think it's worth it. And so 
I really was very focused when I went on making sure that it wasn't just me experiencing this, but as you said, what can I bring back and how can I make more of a difference in my work through my experiences in attending? And I think there's a few things. So um, on the Harvard level, we have already, through some of the meetings that myself and some of my colleagues had there, so my colleagues from within health, we've now established collaborations across Harvard with different areas and some of the different schools, which did not exist and were not thought about before we went to COP and being able to come together and say, actually, health needs to be part of these bigger conversations, I think is going to make a really resounding difference. One of the things that struck me significantly and much more actually from the Australian perspective from the US. So I spent a bit of time in the US pavilion and in the Australian pavilion. In the US pavilion, there was very good representation from senior government level in health. So a lot of the leaders in health in the US were there and having conversations and looking at how they can address sustainability in healthcare systems, what they need to do for communities and adaptation that was very encouraging. In the Australian pavilion, there was no significant health representation from our government or from any uh, significant levels at all, really, and very, very disappointing. So what I took from that, um, I've already spoken to senior government colleagues in Australia and other senior people in non-governmental organisations to say we need to elevate the health voice in the climate discussions in Australia and health needs to be a part of this. We need stronger representation in health at the next COP. One of the things that I think Australia missed out on is this UK and US collaboration. Um, there's been a bit written about how they're very keen to have other countries involved. If Australia had had some health representation there, there could have at least been the, those discussions as well. So there's an awful lot we can do. And one of my big takeaways was we've had some wins. We have so much more that we need to do, uh, both in terms of mitigation and adaptation. And it's really given me a lot more impetus to work really hard on the work that I do. There's a, thank you. There's another question in the chat from Joanne Burke. She wants to know, given the, the, health, the, the healthcare costs, is there any movement by some of these large healthcare providers, insurers to demand more relative to climate change? And that's a great question. And I think if you look at the environment in the US compared to somewhere like the NHS in the UK and Australia is similar in that way as well, where Australia and the UK both have these large socialized healthcare systems that are run by the government. So it's much easier for those systems to say, we're doing this. In the US where a lot of healthcare is highly privatized, then there is more of that, who is going to do what on an individual basis than there is in those other countries. And I think that there's a few parts to that. So one is as you've identified insurance. So the risk now to healthcare systems is immense and climate change as a risk should be at the forefront of risk registers for most organizations now. So risk and insurance is a real impetus for organizations to appreciate and move on this. You will still get some places that just don't and they won't unless there's regulation that makes them do it. So mm -hmm. to me that, I honestly think to be involved in health and to not be acting on climate change, it's difficult to, to justify that because then you're really significantly adversely affecting the health of your population and you're saying that you care about their health. You have to act on climate change. Any other questions? I will yeah, comment. I oh, go ahead, Joan. So thank you again for a great presentation. And you, when you started, it what really struck me is so many people uh, that are are operating in the U.S. really don't understand 1.5 degrees centigrade. Like it, it, they I think they feel like, well, when I have a head cold, my temperature goes up right. and I'm fine. And how do we get? I mean, how do we translate? I know Yale's doing a lot on climate science. So how do we get it so that 1.5 doesn't sound, God forbid, academic, and you know, and it's just, um, it's it's really amazing. But in fairness, if that's not where your orbit is, 
you know, just even in the US, we're calling it climate change, and it appears more in the literature from Europe that I see as the climate crisis. So it is a crisis. So is there anything out there that you come across that says climate change 101, this is why 1.5, because I've really been looking for something like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you've you've really hit the nail on the head. It's very hard. It's very hard to communicate that. And because a lot of people just go, well, it's, you know, the difference between 1.5 and 2 is not that much. So it doesn't really matter that much. We can go over a little bit, but it's immense. It's just absolutely immense. So I think there's multiple parts to that. It's communicating, as you said, in a non-academic way, just the magnitude of what we are facing and what we need to do. That's and as you mentioned, Yale is doing great work. There's various other um, climate communication courses that are around. I've done a couple of them that are around how to communicate to different groups of people on climate change, what makes a difference, what doesn't make a difference. We know that personal stories make a big difference. So I didn't include any of my personal stories in this talk. But one of the ones that I often include is as an emergency physician, I've seen a patient before on a 110 degree day who walked for two and a half hours to get groceries because she didn't have a car and she didn't have access to public transport. So all of the messaging that we do around heat and how dangerous it is, she understood that, but she had to feed her family. And so that really underlines to me how this is a tricky puzzle to solve. And that's why we need to think about poverty and all those other things when we're talking about adaptation. But I see patients like her all the time now and telling those stories can be very powerful and we know that health professionals are very well trusted in the community and our voices are really important to get those messages across. Curtis Bay Singer has a question about wondering if there's any indication that CMS or the Joint Commissions will be mandating standards for healthcare systems to monitor for impacts of climate change. Yeah, so there's been some discussion around that, and there was some discussion around that at COP. There's likely, very likely to be mandatory um, reporting, both in terms of mitigation and targets, but also around adaptation measures too, and the monitoring for impacts of climate change and the vulnerability comes into that. And I expect we will see much firmer commitments and movement on that in the next year or so as well. Okay. Any other questions? So one more, sorry to, um, but given the um, the whole equity side, it's often hard to tease out events by race and gender, the way data gets reported. And yet we know women, vulnerable children, the asthma around uh, low-income, under-resourced areas. So in that same mode, do you feel that there'll be more of a call to collect data by race demographics and 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 have access to it not hidden somewhere absolutely 100 percent. and there's a very good publication um, from the world health organization that i can provide afterwards as well which is centered around where we need to be doing research and where we don't in terms of climate impacts on health and you've really identified something that's been brought up to me a number of times is that is where research is really lacking it's places like gender where there just hasn't been concentrated research on the specific effects of climate change on gender. There's bits and pieces um, and really all minoritized groups. There's barely little data. So there's a bit of research that's come out now that's looked at um, morbidity and mortality in traditionally redlined communities and have found a link between those communities that were redlined and increased deaths and severe illness during heat waves as well, which kind of comes back to that vulnerability. But it's absolutely an area that we need to be focusing on and, de and dedicating more time on. And, and certainly that's some of my future research will be looking at some of those areas. It's kind of difficult to figure out how to do some of it, but it's important. Thank you. There's That's a great. Thank you. It's a raised hand, Andres. Oh, hi. I'm Andre Honore, and I'm uh, from Tucson, Arizona. Um, um, you know, I, I have a, a couple of comments. I, I really liked your graphics describing um, different levels of temperature increase and its impact on biodiversity and, you know, uh, 
uh, other changes that we can expect. I, I think these graphics should become more popular and available to the public. Uh, uh, so I, I think, you know, um, uh, it would make more impact if you could see things like that in the media, um, local arts, uh, things along those lines. And, you know, another thing that uh, I was thinking of, and, you know, it may be minute, uh, but here in the U.S., uh, People are more attuned to things like pounds, miles, and Fahrenheit. You know, I, I think 1.5 of uh, centigrade may be somewhat abstract for Americans. Right. Yeah, I, I think that we should probably place more emphasis on using um, increases in Fahrenheit here in the U.S. rather than in centigrades. Mm -hmm. I think that's very interesting. I've not come across work that looks at um, whether that would make a difference or if anyone's planning to communicate that. But um, I think you're 100% right because when I give these talks, I always convert. Well, usually there was a graphic there. I didn't, but I always convert when I'm talking about my patient, for example. I know that that was a 45 degree day. I don't say that. I say 113 because I know that that is understood and that actually makes a difference. If I say 45, people might go, oh, yeah, maybe that's what I'm not sure. 113, people go, yep. Now I get it. So I think there's something in what you're saying. Absolutely. Thank you. There's another question from Carl. Um, how are government research funding organizing organizations addressing climate and health, such as AHRQ, National in Institute of Medicine, HRSA? Yeah, absolutely. So I think more increasingly, and especially in the US, I found compared to Australia, is that climate change and health is really on the agenda now for many things. What we have seen is it is a lot more the mitigation side that is being addressed. So looking at climate, sustainable, green healthcare systems, et cetera, I mean, it's absolutely crucial. We know that um, if we considered the global healthcare systems, that would be the five, five, fifth largest country in terms of emissions. Mm -hmm. So for both Australia and the US, we're looking at about 8% of our um, countries' carbon emissions come from the healthcare system. So mitigation of carbon emissions for healthcare is critical. What has been a little disappointing to me is there hasn't been a lot of funding calls or a lot of work around addressing adaptation, and that is equally crucial. As I tried to highlight a few times, no matter what we do, even if all of the countries decide to be as ambitious as they possibly can be, this is what we have we have this for a century, we have these climate impacts, we have our population suffering, and we need to work on adaptation as well. And I would really like to see more emphasis on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't know if you're aware that New Hampshire Healthcare Workers for Climate Action actually is working to try to get New Hampshire institutions signed up on the health system sustainability goal. And it's, it's quite a challenge with a lot of small um, independent institutions and and dealing with pandemics and all sorts of other stuff getting the attention has been very challenging so thank goodness we have a group working diligently on that any other questions well i just wanted it's, it's, it's four minutes of so we'll give everybody back a few minutes to their evening thank you so much for sharing this really wonderful personal insight to what a cop is like. I think all of us were very pleased to know how how interesting it is and, and share your experience, even if it's vicariously. And uh, so thank you again. I appreciate your time this evening. And thank you all so much and continue what you're doing. And it. Um, it needs all of us. So thank you. It's just Absolutely. Wonderful. And good luck with your, uh, your fellowship over at the T Chan School. Take care. Thanks so much. Thank you.